there. Welcome to Nomadic Diaries. We're the podcast that takes you on journeys through the lives of those who have already embraced the international lifestyles. Whether you're an expat, a digital nomad, or someone who's dreaming of those lifestyles, this is your passport to a world of insight. We dive deep into the hearts and minds of the overseas lifestyle professionals, the authors, and researchers. Join us in this fun adventure as we deconstruct all the elements of expat and nomadic lifestyles, one captivating story at a time. Hi. Welcome, everybody, to Nomadic Diaries. My name is Doreen Cumberford. It is my pleasure today to introduce you to Kelly hayes Rate. She has been an international pet sitter for the last 12 years after spending a journalistic career all over the world. She's recently resettled in Portugal. And today we're going to be talking about connecting to a tribe, finding people and building your tribe. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you, Doreen. It's so good to see you again. Well, it's lovely to see you. And recently you have traveled to the U.S. again, I noticed. So you're still on the road in a way. (laughs) <laughs> so itchy feet are really hard to uh, smooth out, you know. <laughs> so I noticed that it was 2022 when you made a big choice to settle in Lisbon in Portugal. Can you speak to us a little bit about that so we have some context? Sure. Um, well, let me just back up a little bit more. Um, for almost 30 years, I was a political consultant in California and an activist. I ran for office myself, got my but kicked and decided I needed to take a break from politics. That was back in 2006. I can't believe it's been that long. Uh, And what I ended up doing was going to the Middle East and reporting from there and working with refugees. And I also rented out my personal house as a vacation rental. But in order to make math work, I had to live elsewhere for free. And that's when I discovered pet sitting. In fact, my first overseas pet sit, Doreen, was in London during the Olympics. That whole summer. Oh, Oh, it was a blast. I was there for two months and I was taking care of a cat. Uh, And I was in East London. I was two tube stops away from the Olympic Village. And London was just, it was such a a privilege and a joy to be able to be there for so long um, during this very, very exciting time when the city was just showing its finest. And that's what hooked me on international house sitting. So I did that for the next 12 years. I actually decided to settle down in 2020. And I knew I wanted to relocate to Europe. I'd sold my house by then. In a house in California. Um, and so I had a whole bunch of house sits lined up in Europe for the summer of 2020 that naturally all evaporated when the pandemic hit. Mm. So I was stuck in the UK for two years. Thank goodness I was stuck in the UK because I had contacts there and I could speak the language and I was able to get a long enough visa to be able to ride it out. But it was during that time I did my own armchair traveling to decide what country I wanted to live in in Europe. And I chose Portugal. I wanted a country that was kind of in the South, a little bit more Mediterranean climate. And Portugal has a very welcoming visa. People are wonderful. They're very, very proud of their country, their heritage, their culture, their food, their language. It's it's just wonderful to live among people who are so positive about their own country. And they have meant a lot of reason to be because it's a really beautiful one. So I'm very pleased to be here. I've been here a year and a half now. Although I I have settled, I am still traveling, as you noted. I'm still (laughs) house-sitting. Don't get back to London. It's Uh, hard not to. And why would you settle? I mean, why would you settle for less? I I think this, this word settle is actually a bit of a misnomer. Because when I think of settling, I think of almost stopping. And I believe that people like you have a drive and a motivation, a curiosity, and a different cultural perspective that equips you to travel the world well. What do you think? Well, I I certainly, you know, I did it full time for 12 years, which is an awfully long time. And uh, for me, I loved it. It was a joy. I had fantastic experiences. I am great at cocktail parties, lots of good stories. But after a while, you know, even new gets old. And I was missing, and this will segue into what I know you wanted to talk about. I was truly missing a community. So my community was global. It was just like we're doing right now online, which is great. Got me through the pandemic, got me through 12 years of traveling full time, but it's not the same as picking up the phone and having a spontaneous cup of coffee with a girlfriend over in the local Jardim. Exactly. 
And I have more of an opportunity to do that um, as I'm building that and creating that. Excellent. And my next question is, why did this become important to you? Why did community become important to me? Mm-hmm. I mean, you, what did you notice that you missed? Well, when I was house sitting and traveling so much, you know, they got lonely. I mean, it was exciting and fun. And and of course, I was staying in people's homes and they were wonderful. And I had the pets, which was just delightful. But, you know, it's nice to build memories with someone. I'm single. Mm -hmm. I'm a single woman. And so it's nice to be able to build memories with good friends or um, a significant other or, uh, you know, anyone. And so I really didn't have that. Mm -hmm. One of the strategies that I would do when I was house sitting was to ask my homeowner to introduce me to someone, to some neighbors or girlfriend or something like that. And some of those people have stayed in my life and are still really good friends. One woman I met in Amsterdam, who was just the girlfriend of the woman I was house sitting for, we talk almost every week and have been for, you know, years. And it's just a very, very nice friendship. I haven't seen her in a million years, but we talk every week. Yeah, And so it's a very nice connection. But, you know, I think during lockdown, when I was not traveling and I was sedentary, I realized just how much more productive and creative I was because I wasn't constantly thinking about my travel logistics and where I was going to be living next month and how to get there and what to take and how to move the luggage and what currency I'd need and what visas I'd need and all those details, those, those extremely important details that take up a lot of brain space. You're suddenly not part of my life because I was in one place for two years. And I just realized that there was just so much more I could do. And I really missed seeing people mm-hmm. because I, I was in Scotland for most of that time. I know you're, you're Scottish and <laughs> Scots really were very compliant with the lockdown. And so it was a very isolating time for me, even though I was online all the time. And it just made me realize how important to me community was and how I felt like I wanted to travel more on my own terms rather yes. than chasing house sits and Yes. needing to go with yes. other people's schedules all the time. So, yes. Different yes. dynamic for me now. So for the listener, just to position this a little bit, I've interviewed a few, well, a couple of people in the last few weeks who have been nomading for a while and who are now helping other people to become nomads and how to move with their businesses. And this morning I read that there will be 90 million digital nomads by the year 2026, I believe. Wow, that's so cool. We've become so internationally mobile. I mean, if there's any way to stop war, it's to make people meet each other, right? Yes. I think that's, that's just, that's so, fa- I'm, you, thank you for saying that. That just warms my heart. It's uh, well, a great statistic. It's so exciting for me because um, you're the second person in a couple of weeks that has just been thrilled because you see the opportunities and the difference it makes when we spend time with others in a different culture, in a different language. Absolutely. I mean, I think there's no greater thing than traveling. And frankly, Doreen, that's one of the things that I love about house sitting is that I like providing the service of giving pet owners an opportunity to travel worry-free. So very early in my political career, one of my coworkers and I were talking about traveling, and he said that he and his wife never traveled because they had two large rescue dogs that were just needed a lot of attention. Yes. And I remember feeling very badly for him that Mm. here he and his wife had made this beautiful choice to take in these two rescue dogs and it was at the expense of being able to travel so being able to provide that service to pet owners is just as a real joy for me in addition to my own joy at being in a new location and it's like paying it forward isn't it perhaps you're not uh, a digital nomad in terms of you're not attached to some sort of a computer business and you're remote well I, i am I mean, house sitting is very much attached to a computer. You know, that's how you get the house sits. That's how you do the interviews. That's how you send your agreement. I mean, all of that. Plus I I write. And so, you know, I'm constantly writing and sending things in to to my clients. To Um, articles. You write articles. Articles and articles and blogs. Yes. Mm Mm-hmm. And, and I added books. And so all of my clients have been virtual. Exactly. What I meant was you, you are offering a service, but not in a corporate environment. That's very true. Freelance. It's mm-hmm. parallel to a corporate environment. 
We have a lot of corporate digital nomads in this country. And so there are all sorts of ways to live this lifestyle, right? Portugal offers a special digital nomad visa. So I don't have the details on it because that's not the visa that I'm on, but they do offer a special digital nomad visa. So I think it's very exciting for countries to open up to digital nomads because not only is it smart for the country because they're bringing in people with specific knowledge who have a very low environmental footprint and who bring and who contribute to the economy and contribute to the culture. So I think it, it's a win-win in a lot of different ways. So I'm, I'm excited to see more countries looking at this as an option. I understand there's a community of digital nomads in Madeira. Um, I was on an advisory board, let's call it, during COVID for digital nomads setting off how to do it, how to get started, where to go. And they were setting up a, a community in Madeira. Have you ever been to that community? I haven't been to Madeira yet. I'm really looking forward to going. Oh, I've yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard that. So tell me a little bit more. You have obviously a long history and a career that has been very mobile even before you became a pet sitter. So you had skills that you brought with you into this arena that you already had honed and practiced. What do you think some of those skills were? Because you were in the Middle East and you were working with refugees. Can you go back a little bit to that? Well, I mean, even before that, as a political consultant and spokesperson in California, I was traveling all around the state talking about different environmental issues or social change issues, social justice issues that were the campaigns that I was working on. So I'm used to talking with and listening to a variety of different people and working in different cultures in that sense. I mean, California is all, sure. you know, Americans, but I mean, different different groups of people with different perspectives. So, so I'm, I'm pretty adept and comfortable doing that. And so as I started traveling in the Middle East, you know, I was working in conflict zones. And so that's a whole other conversation. That's a whole other type Mm -hmm. of of experiences and traveling. Um, But it still involved listening to people and trying to understand their perspective and and being able to articulate their perspective for other audiences. So taking these people's experiences who had lived through, many of them, some really horrific things where they'd lost I mean, refugees. It's an astounding population of people because they've lost everything. They've yes. lost their tribe, their community. They've lost perhaps family members, perhaps limbs. They've lost jobs. They've lost histories. Homes. They've, you know, homes. <laughs> I mean, all of it. And and what astounds me still always about refugees is their resilience and yes. their willingness to keep fighting forward and keep moving forward, usually for mm-hmm. their kids. It's just it's, it's mm-hmm. extraordinary. Mm-hmm. And it's that piece that I try to try to get at when I talk to refugees is what keeps them going. How do they keep going? Yes. And yeah. uh, what do they hope for the future? And then try to convey that to audiences that have not had experiences with refugees. And um, after three interviews asking people, what is cultural intelligence? I believe that you are an exemplary of what cultural intelligence is, because this is the intelligence that is naturally builds into people as we have more contact with others and we build that intelligence. So it's a very, very different and interesting world that we live in. So let's go back to talking about communities. You have a history of building community. You built community when you were in California, when you were in politics. You have a history of building communities online and through the house and the pet sitting world. And now you have created a different form of community. So what do all these things have in common? It's easier for me to talk about what they don't have in common. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's a great answer. So I think I built my communities in California. They were mostly my coworkers, people Mm -hmm. that I worked on campaigns with and that I clicked with and would continue seeing them socially after the Mm -hmm. uh, campaign was over. With house sitting, people I clicked with, I didn't click with every single homeowner that I house sat for. But many of them I did, and they've continued to be in my life. So I think that's the way most of us make our immediate friends is through um, our shared experiences with our careers and and when we're sharing experiences that way. Now, I'm retired. So I'm 62. I'm newly retired. I'm semi-retired. I still do editing and writing. But I don't have that work community the way Mm -hmm. I did just a few years ago. And so I think some of the faces, some of the things that I'm facing about community are are very typical of people who've been living in the same hometown for years, but are not working anymore. And, you know, so it's like, how do they transition making new friends and making a new Mm -hmm. group of, of comrades when they're not 
working mm-hmm. and hanging out with their coworkers. So in one sense, I think what I'm experiencing right now in Lisbon after having been here a year and a half, is not dissimilar from what anybody, any other new, newly retired person would, would feel. Sure. Um, sure. Now what is different is that I'm far away from family. I'm far away from long-term friends. I mean, they're all back in California. It's t- 24 hours door to door for me to go from Lisbon to LA, Yes, you know, so it's, it's quite difficult and it's even difficult to keep up with those friendships online because of the eight hour time difference. That's a challenge. I've also noticed since I've relocated is that um, not all of my friends wanted to follow with me. <laughs> and I don't mean physically, but I mean, friendship wise, you know, that just, I think happens. Some of my friendships that I'd had for years don't feel like they fit anymore. So there's a winnowing for me anyway, there was a winnowing that took place when I moved. And I think that's probably not uncommon. And then being here, how do I find my new tribe? When I'm in a culture that I'm not familiar with, I I don't speak Portuguese. I'm learning, but not well enough to be able to have Mm, Portuguese friends. Yeah. BFFs, you know, right. Mm -hmm. So that means that I hang out a lot with the immigrant community, mostly people from the States and frankly, Mm -hmm. mostly women my age, Mm-hmm. mostly single women, you know, mm-hmm. we, we tend to gravitate mm-hmm. toward who we know. Sure. And those, those are the people that I initially started meeting mostly through Facebook. Facebook is extremely robust among the immigrant population here in Portugal, actually among Portuguese as well. Meetup is another big one. I mean, they're just great ways to find different groups of people to hang out with. I initially went and hung out with big groups of people and felt like that was too overwhelming for me. That was what I did when I was in my yes. political career. When I yeah. worked a room, I can do it. I can work a room like nobody else, but it feels like work to me. It's yes. not fun and it's not relaxing. So I had to figure out different ways of meeting people. And one of the ways that I'm doing that is by getting involved in some groups that are activities that I enjoy. So for example, I take a yoga class twice a week that's just right around the corner from where I live. It's taught in Portuguese. I'm the only immigrant in there. It is excellent. I'm getting stretched in all kinds of ways because these women yammer at me in Portuguese and teach me new words every time I go. Yes, I've been there. (laughs) Uh Yes. Uh So it's it's initially it was a little disconcerting, but I'm having fun there now because the women are opening up to me. I'm, you know, they, they all speak English, by the way, they didn't initially until I started speaking Portuguese until one day I asked in Portuguese, if it was possible to open the window. And then all of a sudden they opened up to me and it turns out three of them used to be English teachers taught taught English as a second language. They don't just speak some Portuguese, right? But I needed to put myself out there and to show myself. Yeah. And and now we have conversations mostly in English, but they teach me a few Portuguese words and phrases along the way. And it's fun and I feel like I belong there. Now, are they my BFFs? Have I been out to coffee or a meal with them? Have I met any of their spouses or relatives or anything? No. But they're people that I see twice a week. There's there's a continuity. I feel like I belong there finally. And that gives me a sense of community. That, just that little tiny bit. Does that also give you a sense that you have access to a cultural mentor? Cultural mentoring is something we've talked about quite a bit on Mm -hmm. um, several of the recordings. And basically, that's someone who is part of the culture. My my cultural mentor lives right next door. He's our Mexican uh, architect and neighbor, very well spoken. But when there's a cultural uh, question or something that comes up, having someone that you can go to ask questions and to learn makes a difference, right? That probably does. I don't have that here. Although I would say that I would use Facebook for that because Mm. there are some immigrant uh, Facebook groups, particularly an American group that has of Americans that have moved here. And, um, And many Portuguese people are part of that group as well. And so it's a good place to ask about some cultural things, but also about just technical moving to Portugal stuff. You know, has anybody had experience with this particular health insurance company? I just heard that the, that the rules about getting a driver's license have changed, What you know, anybody know anything about them? So it's an opportunity to ask a lot of those questions to get answers, both from other immigrants who've lived here a lot longer than I have, and also from experts, from Portuguese people, you know, who are just great. in the group themselves. So yeah, the way I get those questions answered. So you were talking about um, it winnowing down, and I have looked over the landscape of the last several decades, and 
noticed that there's very few people that I have been able to, I call it kind of pack up my friendships and carry them with me. Mm -hmm. It seems like after a period of time, there is that whittling away sort of a sensation, unless you have a structure and a huge commitment to keep it going, right? Yes. And, you know, sometimes those are changes in lifestyle or changes in life experiences. I, I have a very dear friend, Anne, from when I was 17 and newly in Washington, D.C., and she and I roomed together. And we stayed friends for many years when we were both in Washington. And then she moved to Philadelphia and got married. I was a bridesmaid. And when we stayed in touch, but then she started having kids and, yeah. you know, it was Christmas cards and birthday cards and maybe yeah. a phone call every once in a while. And then her husband died. God, I loved Peter. Her husband died two years ago and her kids are grown and, you know, she's got a lot more time on her hands. And so we've been talking a lot more frequently and we've made more of an effort to see each other when I've been in the States. So friendship has rekindled It's because it is one of those friendships that's a lifelong one. But now we our life circumstances are just different. And so we have more of an opportunity to spend time together chatting. And that's important um, because for the listener's benefit, when you were talking about nomadism and, and moving, there are seasons of life and generational experiences about this as well. So it, it can be very, very different depending on our life stages, I think. So for people who are considering being nomads and are considering getting on the road, I just want to point out again something that seems to be a regular beat here, which is unintended consequences. <laughs> well, I think it's important for anyone who does intend to travel or to relocate to really think about how their tribe and how they want to create community as they're making those plans, because it's it's part of it. And it's not anything I thought about until I was traveling full time for a while and started coming up with strategies and being very proactive about it. As I said, I would ask my homeowner for contacts and that would be part of the initial conversation I would have with them because it's not something that a homeowner would necessarily think about. And, and whether or not I was allowed to have a guest during the house sit, right. that's become right. more important to me now so that I could share yes. the experience with friends. Having said that, as I was making my plans to move to Portugal and thinking about all the things that need to happen before you relocate to another country, I never once thought about how am I going to make a community? How am I going to make friends? Oh, really? Mm -hmm. And I wish I had given it just a little bit of thought. I don't know that I would have done things necessarily hugely differently. I might have joined a yoga class earlier, you know, things like that, done some of those things a little bit earlier, or made more of an effort to meet some of the people, to get together with some of those people that I was meeting online or meeting at these large group functions. And I just didn't because I was sort of single-mindedly thinking about all of, about unpacking and buying furniture and doing all the bureaucratic things that I needed to do that one has to do when one relocates to a new country. But I, I wish I had spent just a little bit more time at the beginning nurturing some, some of those friendships. That's probably what I, what I would have done differently, but I didn't think about it. And so well, I this really is, encourage people to think about it, as you've said. Yeah, this is, this is great. This is fantastic wisdom because I frequently talk about the suitcase and the invisible suitcase that we have two suitcases. One's got our stuff and the rest has got our mental baggage and our mental baggage or our invisible baggage are things like our financial situation has to be reevaluated and moved. And, you know, we have to pay attention to the finances and all the fiscal parts of our lives. We have to pay attention to the relationships. That's invisible as well. We have to pay attention to our health mm -hmm. and we have to pay attention to our purpose and our career and our well-being, if that's something that you're going to pack, right? I think it's Almost impossible for one human being to consider it all during the midst of the move. What do you think? Well, that is, I mean, just, just the logistics alone are overwhelming. Exactly. You know, I mean, I moved here with five boxes of stuff and that was kind of about it. And I had no furniture. And so I had a, a, an empty apartment. Didn't even have lights. I know. remember. So, you remember but it was such an adventure. <laughs> watching you, even watching you was an adventure. So you you, you documented <laughs> it like any good journalist would document it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of a lot of Facebook videos. But the, the thing that saved me was I, I took a house sit here in Lisbon and that gave me a chance to breathe. It was about two weeks, two and a half weeks. And so it got me off my air mattress. It got me into a nice, cozy place with a big, wonderful dog and a comfy cat and Netflix at night. 
and uh, coffee yes. cups. I had coffee cups. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I don't know if you remember me complaining on Facebook that I didn't even have a freaking coffee cup, but I was bound and determined not to bring anything into this new apartment that I didn't absolutely love. And so I really took my time furnishing it. I did almost everything off of Facebook marketplace that everything is secondhand. Everything in here has a story from when I bought it and when I moved it, who brought it over, how it happened. And that just makes me feel so much more joyous about my home now. But you know, that was an overwhelming thing for me. And so did I think about friends at that point? No, I didn't, but it would have been really nice to have had a girlfriend to go out and have a glass of wine with every once in a while. Yes. Yeah. Or to go shopping with or to, you know, surf the internet with or any of those things. Sure, right, sure. Right. But don't you think that at some level these things start to happen as we start to relax and we start to build our bandwidth? I, my picture of it in my head is that you arrive and you arrive with your stuff and you're wide open. You're sort of not touristing, but you're you're paying attention to so much and our senses only have so much reach. Yes. Yeah. But I think but you mentioned all of those things that are in our invisible suitcase. Yes. And while they all don't have to have exactly the same weight at exactly the same time, they still all matter. Exactly. So so knowing about them ahead of time, Mm -hmm. which I didn't do, I didn't think about my tax situation when I relocated. Mm -hmm. Duh. You know, I was here Mm -hmm. for six months before I went, oh my goodness, I've really got to pay attention to this. All of a sudden, (laughs) everything else went out the window while I focused on figuring out what to do about my taxes. So it's, you know, I mean, all of those things that you mentioned are important. They may not all be as important as each other at exactly the same time, but it's exactly things to keep in mind. You know, I think, I think that's important. Yes. I, I think it's good to know that we need to pay attention and it's like juggling. You know, you only hold one ball at a time and then you move it around. And so I think it's paying attention at the appropriate time. But it's good to know what you have to juggle, right? Because sometimes I think um, we're faced with circumstances where we're not understanding exactly what we've done and what the ramifications are. (laughs) Speaking as one who's done that. (laughs) Yes. I mean, I have my to-do list right here for the month of January. I started doing monthly to-do lists because I couldn't stand doing weeks anymore. And I have one, two, three, four. I have eight different categories of things that I want to complete by the end of the month. And they're moving to Portugal stuff. There's uh, taxes, things that I still want to do here in the apartment, things that I want to do with friends and Mm -hmm. how I want to create more friendships, things for my health, things for improving my income. So I have all of these different categories with things underneath them. And I don't do something from each category every day. I'll focus on one category and do two or three things, but it's all here. Look at that, a spreadsheet, a spreadsheet. It's not, not I'm so not a spreadsheet person. This is Well, it's a spreadsheet on a piece of paper. (laughs) But for the listeners, Kelly held up a large piece of paper, which looked like um, a penciled in version of uh, Google Notes or an Excel sheet. And I am so impressed. (laughs) This is very good information for people who are considering this lifestyle or have jumped into it and gone, oh, what do we do now? <laughs> yes, I know. Yes. <laughs> You're really shining the light on the importance of belonging and a little bit about how to belong to a new tribe. So where are you in your tribe building capacity? In, in oh, um... That's a very good question. So I have a couple of girlfriends that I met at the beginning mm-hmm. who, had, who had arrived here, oh, like a year before I had. And they've stayed in my life. I've, I've met others during that period of time that have kind of fallen away for whatever reason. They've got other priorities. Some of them mm-hmm. have moved, right? So not everybody moves and stays. Yes. They move around or they move back. Yes. So it's it's like dating, you know, it's like speed it dating, is, trying to it's figure very out transitional. It, it's very transitional. It's a transitional place. Yes. It is very much so. So that was at the beginning. Now I've met more people in my own neighborhood, which is nice because, you know, we can do things close and together and last yes. minute. And it's just easier that way. That's a lot of fun. I, I'm about to join an improv group. So excited about that. That'll be great. Yeah. And it's mostly younger Portuguese people. So that should be interesting. I've met a couple of people online 
you know, like on Facebook groups, but locally here, and we've gotten together for coffee and have become friends. So I'm at the point now where I feel like I've got more bandwidth in my life to be able to accommodate more friends and different yeah. levels of friends. So um, I'm looking to expand that a little bit more. And, you know, and sometimes it's just looking for people to do things with. Another part of the friendship puzzle that was something I didn't really think about much was my first spring, a whole bunch of people wanted to come and visit <gasps> or they were visiting anyway, and they wanted me to help set up their trip for them. And I was in Portuguese language classes at that point. And I was still trying to deal with my own furnishing and moving and all that stuff. And there was just no, and I had to say to people, I mean, I had to be kind of rude. Look, I'm really sorry. I cannot create your trip for you. I can do this much time depending on who the person was and whether they were coming specifically to visit me or they were just happening to be here. So I had to be very clear with my boundaries uh, about what I could do with people. And some of them tried to overstep those boundaries. And I just said, Look, I'm really sorry, but I told you this is not an ideal time for me to try to play tour guide. Mm -hmm. I'm now feeling like I could do that. And yes. so I'm feeling more welcoming to people who are coming or said they wanted to come and I'm more encouraging them to come and we can spend time together and do things together. And I'm happy to help set up different day trips to other places in Portugal that I haven't seen yet because it's an opportunity to explore. You know, I kind of have gone through my own cycle on that. And your own evolution. Wow. Yes, because mm -hmm. um, setting boundaries is really important because I think we can easily become overwhelmed in the midst of a transition. And if we know we have to set boundaries, we can start to think about them. But if we don't understand that it's necessary, well, so good for you for de noticing and defining them and communicating them quickly. Thank you. And enforcing them. <laughs> And then, do you feel like the enforcer? <laughs> well, and sometimes when I had to, you know, because, you know, some people like to push a little bit. So like they keep, not, you know, tell us this, tell us this. And I was like, look, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's more fun now. So I have had people come to visit, stay with me or stay near me. And uh, we've done some things together. And that's been just fun because it is building those kinds of memories with friends. And that's what really is good for the invisible side of ourselves, our soul story, which really is what this um, nomadic lifestyle or travel lifestyle is about, isn't it? It's mm -hmm. it, we're, we're sort of telling our we're telling our life's journey by the movement and where we choose to spend our time and where, what place we're going to be in. Mm -hmm. So for someone who is looking for a good fit communities, what would you recommend? Defined community? Mm -hmm. I'm going to say online because it's just so fantastic. Meetup is great. That's where I found some some supper clubs and some um, well, improv group and, you know, that kind of thing. That's a lot of fun. Internations in some cities is really yes. fantastic. Um, yes. I, I'm still a member of the London theater group and stay in touch with people from that. And that's fun because it's an opportunity to go see a dance performance or a theatrical sure. performance with friends rather than going alone, which I've sure. done before. But, you know, it's just nicer to share the experience sometimes. Sure. So there are groups like that. I think if you're going to be in a place for any length of time, for a few months or more, going to a yoga class or taking dance lessons or joining a running group or some sort of activity that's fun for you that you can share with somebody else and meet people who have similar likes and dislikes, a book club, a writing group, singing group, music group, any of those kinds of things I think are, are great for using common bonds as a way of, of developing some friendships. Frankly, Doreen, I think one of the most important things about friendships is maintaining them. And the person who's traveling yeah. kind of has to be the heavy lifter on that one. I and, agree. And that could be really hard when you're thinking about you know, the next plane you have to catch or what's it going to look like in your next co-housing place or your co-working space or your house sitting space and trying to juggle all that newness because the newness takes up a lot of brain space. Where's the grocery store? Where's the toothpaste in the grocery store? Yeah. I mean, I hate grocery shopping, but I love the fact that and when I, I can walk into my local grocery store and close my eyes and go find my toothpaste and not have to think about it. But when I'm traveling, that takes brain cells. And energy. 
They're for energy because right. our brain burns a lot of our energy, right? Right, exactly. It takes a lot of attention is what is what I'm saying. And that's attention that doesn't get spent on other things. Mm -hmm. So I think focusing on keeping track of the and, and keeping up with the friendships that have been created is really important. And I've certainly yes. been guilty of not doing that to the extent that I'd like as I've traveled. You know, whenever I did, it was really important. Yeah. And I have to say that I am with you. When I look over, you know, all these decades, there's just a couple of people that I am in touch with from four decades ago and, mm. uh, you know, many decades in between. Um, one of the things that I'm very grateful for is that uh, we had a corporate experience and in the Middle East and Japan. And now I don't know where any of those people are who were on our team in Japan, but there's a good chance we'll see a couple of them uh, when we have a reunion in August, September, because wow. they're going to do a reunion. Yeah. So, and uh, one of the big disappointments of our life during COVID was my husband was heading up the corporate reunion for Aramco at that time in 2020 and had like between two and 300 people coming for, you know, several days to Colorado and, and that all got canceled. And so, you know, it was, that was just one of the pain points. But now this year, we're going to be getting back to see some of these people. And that's what I was saying about structure. But you have, if you can find a structure with these people or something that is easily repeatable or that you can carry forward, that makes a difference. And I think it's also important to, to continue to be real with your friends. Um, yes. To not make it be like, uh, you know, a bragging postcard every time you send an email. You know, absolutely. One-to-one -one connection is not like Facebook posts. It's an opportunity to keep a connection going, to talk about what's good and what's exciting, but also what's scary, what's daunting, what's overwhelming, what's what you don't like, you know, because I mean, yeah. let's face it, you know, full-time travel, any travel is not always 100% perfect and wonderful. Exactly. In fact, it's usually the things that go wrong that make the most interesting stories, right? Exactly. If you, if you, read, if you read travel essays, it's always about the thing that gone wrong. <laughs> yes, because nobody remembers everything that went right. <laughs> Well, and nobody wants to read about everything that went right because it That's just sounds true. like bragging. So yeah. I, I have some friends that I stay in touch with through WhatsApp and through email. And it seems like every single time they write me, it's, oh, we're sitting on the beach listening to the waves or, oh, we're, do you know, mm. and I'm like, oh, come on. I've been there. I know what you guys are dealing with. Just yeah. get real with me yeah. so that yeah. we can build that bond and create that right. bond that way. Right. And um, and I'm not talking about constant bitch, so, you know. Uh, sure. Compl not you know, complaining complaints. sessions. Yeah. But the reality because for every up there's a down for every in there's an out you know it's it's balance right right i feel the same way here about meeting other immigrants who were in my circumstances is that you know we get together and we talk about how much we love portugal and we also talk about the struggles that we're having yes learning the language or with some of the cultural differences or just you know trying to deal with the bureaucracy or you know, mm -hmm. none of us wants to move because of any of those things, but it's a way to commiserate and bond and learn from each other yes. and get support and, from each other. And it's a wonderful way to, to build community with people who are in a similar setting, in a similar situation. And so you can build a great shared sense of connection that way. Absolutely. And support, you know, friends like to support each other. That's kind of what, you know, right. I, I like to feel useful in my friends' lives. And, you know, if I can listen to their complaints or their concerns or their worries, even if I can, you know, sometimes I can actually offer some words of wisdom, not often, but, you know, every once in a while, it's nice to be helpful in that way to, to people you care about. It is. And it seems like we've moved into talking a, a little bit for about moving from that nomad situation to your resettling space that circling back to the beginning so what was the hardest thing to juggle in the in-between for you between being on the road and being so competent I mean you were a master of this you <laughs> mastered pet sitting over 12 years which is a long time for anyone to be on the road or not homeless but without that grounding experience of a place. So what were some of the things you think you mastered? Change, um, mm -hmm. adapting, handling all those logistics, 
just in a way that was very efficient. I got better at knowing what kinds of situations made me happy and what kinds of situations didn't. Yes. So, so but that's really important. I, that sounds very simplistic, but you know, I just, I mean, I learned, I learned over time that I didn't like house sits that were kind of out in the country and a little isolating where I needed a car to drive, especially in the winter. Right. In a foreign country. I'm a city girl. And so I like being more in the city and being able to do that. I, so that, that, but that's just me personally. I have a ton of house sitting friends who love the rural sits, who love mucking out the stalls for the horses. And it's like, yes, oh, yes. No. You know, <laughs> Not you. But they love it. You know, they love it and more power to them. And I'll yes. go visit them for two days and have yes. them all of them. But, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm different. And so knowing what I, what makes me tick and what kind of homeowner makes me tick, what kind of situation makes me tick. So if I were a digital nomad thinking about co-work space, I, you know, I would want to think about what type of co-working space is, would make me tick and what wouldn't. And so just all those little different factors that just make it work. So I, I got much better at that as time went on. And that made my house sit, my house sitting experiences more universally rewarding and satisfying. I think the things that I just finally got tired of was the constant moving around and the idea that I needed to find a house sit next. So um, now I do want to say that most people who house sit don't do it full time. They do it for their <laughs> summer vacation. So they do it for a week over Easter break or, you know, yes. over Christmas yes. or something like that. Yeah. People house sit for a whole range of reasons. So, I mean, I house sit because I had nowhere else to go. And so, and I chose places that I wanted to visit. And so it was, there was great opportunity to travel, but I was house sitting because I needed to. Once I decided to move to Portugal, I started house sitting around Portugal to find what city I wanted to live in. Once I got into Portugal, I house sat around to find what neighborhood I wanted to live in. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I house sat when I was trying to, to furnish my apartment. It's almost like a little vacation from your apartment. <laughs> right, right. And I still and I still house sit to get to explore. I mean, I still house sit in Lisbon to explore different yes. parts of Lisbon. So for me, it's a during that phase, during the relocation phase, house sitting was a practical way of getting to know the new areas that I was Yes. looking at yeah. and and yeah. getting my feet wet for that. Yeah. I had been planning on house sitting in other countries that was going to be during the summer of 2020. I was planning on yeah. house sitting in other countries so that I could see which pick and choose that yeah. way. But so there's a, I, I've house sat in the past where I have taken those rural sits and used them as a writing retreat where I didn't yeah. have cultural extra, you know, theater yes. and, and other kinds of things distracting me. I've taken house sits to explore new areas. I've taken house sits when I've had writing assignments. Or pitched writing assignments based on a house that I was taking. So it, you know, it was a way. For example, I house sat in South Korea and Seoul, South Korea, in for five weeks, in December 2019, and I sold uh, six stories off of that and wow. made almost a thousand dollars. Paid for my airfare, you know, for the mm -hmm. house. How wonderful! So yeah, it was very cool, and it kind of gave me something to do. Right, I was on a mission yes. in Seoul, yes. check, you know, researching all these different stories. Yes. And that was a lot of fun. And that gave kind of a structure to me in a place where I did feel very isolated. So yes. um, it helped me feel less isolated. So even yes. though I wasn't building community there, I was keeping myself busy in a different way. Um, and you were connected to your purpose. Yes. You had a different kind of connection. You know, maybe you didn't have a lot of people around or a big community around, but you were connected to your unique and irrepeatable purpose, which is yes. not anyone else's. And yes. so that yes. really that fueled... Fun. Yeah, that was fun. Oh, that sounds terrific. So yeah. what I hear you saying is that you mastered change. And I would say, how many of us can say that we have had the even had the opportunity to master a lot of change? Well, it, don't get me wrong. <laughs> well, I know. I mean, well, there's levels. Know. Yeah, at every level was a new devil, right? <laughs> right. I mean, I mastered changing beds. <laughs> yes. Oh, <laughs> right. And places <laughs> and places. So, um, I, I, I know you're going to post this on the, on the podcast page, but I've written a book called, uh, very cleverly titled how to become a house sitter inside. I was just about to talk Diva. about that. Good, good. Right. <laughs> and my opening line is I sleep around usually with animals. Yes. <laughs> so I mastered sleeping around, but I had to explain that first before I just put that out there. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. Well, I do think that it is an invisible skill of change and adaptation. And, you know, for years we've talked about these skills as being, quote unquote, soft skills. 
But people are really having a different conversation now about these being the hard skills. So mm-hmm. congratulations on mastering some of the hard skills and figuring out who you are, what makes you tick. Because I think for each of us, that's a, for our listeners, that's an individual journey, isn't it? It really is. And, you know, and it's, I, and I'm doing it all over again now as I relocate because yes. I'm a different person now sitting yes. in this apartment. That's my apartment with my stuff, my artwork hanging on the walls, my books on the shelves, your book on my shelf. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> um, you know, it's a, it's a different dynamic for me here. And I think as I've been thinking about this idea of creating a new community, I mean, one of the fun things about it is that I get to create a new persona. And by that, I don't mean be inauthentic, yes. but I don't have to be the same person I was in Santa Monica, yeah. California, or the same mm-hmm. person I was traveling mm-hmm. on the road for 12 years. I get to try on a new pair of Kelly shoes and see what fits. Mm-hmm. Do you think is you're a- reinventing yourself and some ways? I think I'm revising myself. That's yeah. a better term. And only an editor would come up with that term. <laughs> <laughs> right? I think I reinvented myself when I left politics and was really floundering for all those years and trying to yes. figure out what I wanted to, you know, I was 45 trying to figure out what I wanted to do when I grew up. Now I I don't feel like I'm reinventing as much as I'm polishing. revising. Yeah. Revising. That's- yeah. Yeah. That's a wonderful way to put it. Thank you for framing that for us. And <laughs> it's such a joy to speak with you today and to have such an honest conversation about the dark sides and the tra- challenges and what we didn't know and the unintended consequences. I really appreciate you sharing your experiences with us. So before we conclude, do you have one piece of inspiration you'd like to offer the listeners a gift to them today. Do it. Yeah, do it. Yeah. So you, um, so thank you for saying that I was willing to kind of talk about the challenges. I think it's important to be aware of those potential challenges, but not to let them stop us because they're Mm -hmm. not game changers. They're not stoppers. They're just life. You know, things happen in life and, you know, we have challenges when we stay at home in one place for our entire lives and we have challenges when we move around. So I think in, in change is an important, embracing change is an important part of that. And having flexibility is an important part of however we live our lives. So I would hope that people listening today would, would go, all right, how do I do this? Let's get yes. started. Yeah. I know, we'll buy Kelly's book. No, no, I'm kidding. But there let's you know. get started. Let's go. Let's, let's one, one let's way to do it. it. One way to do it is buy Kelly's book. That's, that's very <laughs> true. So please everybody go to uh, Amazon and look for the How to Become a House Sitter, Inside Tips from the House Sit Diva, the import- and, and the importance of house sitting, I think, in this conversation is that, thank you, we'll put this in the show notes too, <laughs> it's one of the ways that we can discover and explore the good fit location for ourselves. Absolutely. And I think knowing your limits, as I said earlier, knowing your limits and knowing what you love are are two of the, mm. the the best ways to figure out what a good fit is, no matter what kind of travel you do, whether it's house sit or digital nomading or just a two-week vacation, knowing yeah. what kind of vacation you want and what you want to get out of it, yeah. whether it's relaxing or cultural stimulation or meeting new people. Mm. It, there's lots of different priorities and understanding what your needs are at any given time will help shape the the decisions you make about stepping out into the world. Well, thank you so much, Kelly. This has been very complete and you've given us a snapshot into your diary, which I really (laughs) enjoyed this conversation. And we had some fun. We will include all your links in the show notes. Where do you prefer that listeners seek you out online? Um, Oh, I think if they're interested in in, uh, house sitting, um, www.housesitdiva.com is the best. And if they're interested in learning about working with me for the writing as a writing coach or editing, probably jumpstartmybook.org. Oh, jumpstartmybook.org. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Need to include that one as well. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Doreen. This is so exciting. I'm Congratulations on this podcast. It's really cool. Thank you. And so listeners, thank you for coming to our kitchen table today for this conversation. And we invite you to share, review, comment, interact, 
find Kelly and follow her because she is someone who has certainly mastered change adaptation, logistics, and can probably be a super mentor in your experience of nomading wherever you are on the globe. Thank you. Thank you.